Modern history is littered with unforgettable moments. From the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and the first moonwalk in 1969, to the Kennedy assassination and the fall of the Berlin Wall, enough big events took place in the 20th century alone, you could probably make a book about it. At the same time, there's a separate lesser known list of events. These events, while not as famous, could have significantly altered the course of history. On this episode of Destination Anywhere, we're going to take a look at seven events that nearly changed the world as we know it. Events that, had they played out just slightly different, the world we know today would just be an alternate imagination. Before we get started, just do me a favor and click the subscribe button and that tiny little bell next to it. It's just good for everyone, I promise. Anyway, let's get to the list. Most music historians know the day the music died was February 3rd, 1959. That's the date musicians Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper, along with pilot Roger Peterson, tragically lost their lives due to a plane crash in an Iowa cornfield. While bad weather coupled with possible pilot error are most likely to blame for the accident, in a sad twist of fate, it's believed dirty clothes played a part as well. With the traveling musicians finishing up a gig at the Surf Ballroom in Clear Lake, Iowa on the night of February 2nd, Holly was eager to fly to the next tour stop in Minnesota, rather than get back on their less than dependable tour bus. With the extra time anticipated, Holly could catch up on some rest as well as get the gang's laundry freshened up before the next show. Unfortunately, this decision would be fatal, and the world would lose four young men that cold winter morning. It's impossible to know how many more hits would have come from Holly, Valens, and the Big Bopper had they not flown that night, but their influence on the direction of music has been felt ever since. So we've all had that time where our computer was malfunctioning and we couldn't figure out why, only to realize we had some background program running that was slowing it down. Well, how about that time you left a nuclear war simulation program running and accidentally sent the military into doomsday preparation? Oh, that never happened to you? Well, alarmingly, it happened at NORAD in 1979. What's NORAD? Ah, it's only the headquarters for protecting the skies over the United States and Canada from any type of airborne attack. So on November 9th of that year, NORAD officials saw what they believed to be an incoming nuclear attack on their computers. As they ordered defense jets into the air and made arrangements for the attack, they realized that all their data wasn't matching up. After some more examination, they realized that a training simulation program had been left running, meaning there was no attack after all. Had this not been realized in a timely manner, there's no telling what type of repercussions this could have had during the Cold War era. While it's well known that Timothy McVeigh was responsible for the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing, not as many people are aware how close he came to getting out of police custody. McVeigh was initially arrested just 90 minutes after the bombing by Highway Patrol Officer Charlie Hanger after a traffic stop led Hanger to the discovery of a concealed pistol on McVeigh. At the time, no one suspected a connection between the events in Oklahoma City and the new inmate in Noble County Jail. Scheduled to see the judge the next day, a prolonged divorce case pushed McVeigh's hearing one more day to Friday. That Friday morning, the judge had to drive his son to school after he missed his bus, further delaying the hearing. It was by this time that the FBI connected McVeigh to the bombing and immediately alerted Noble County to hold McVeigh in custody. Had McVeigh been able to make bail or the judge's son been able to catch his bus, McVeigh could have been released and there's no telling when or even if he would ever be in police custody again not to mention if there would be any more fatalities. Six years later, McVeigh was executed for carrying out the deadly attack in Oklahoma City, and the rest is history. While everyone is used to seeing the Secret Service guard the president today, it wasn't until 1902 that guarding the commander-in-chief was their primary duty. Before that, guarding the president wasn't quite as organized or even considered as serious as it is today. 
That thought kind of explains why there was only one man assigned to guard President Abraham Lincoln on the night of his eventual assassination at Ford's Theater in 1865. Well, one would think even one armed man would have helped guard the president, right? Well, that might be right, unless it was the man assigned that night, John Parker. I don't have time to go into this guy's whole story, but some of his highlights include getting drunk on duty as well as sleeping on the job. Anyway, while Parker had started out the evening guarding Lincoln's theater box that night, he soon vacated to get a better seat to see the play. At intermission, he actually left the theater to grab some beers at the saloon next door. This guy's unbelievable. It's not certain exactly where he was when John Wilkes Booth entered Lincoln's box and ended the president's life, but it's agreed upon that he wasn't there to protect him. Maybe if another officer was assigned to Lincoln's security detail that night, the assassination attempt may have been stopped and Lincoln may have gotten to finish one of the most important presidencies in American history. We all have a pretty good idea how devastating a nuclear bomb can be, which is exactly why the events that played out in Goldsboro, North Carolina in January of 1961 are so alarming. On January 24th, a United States B-52 bomber carrying two nuclear weapons suffered some type of body failure that actually caused one of the wings to come apart while airborne. This malfunction released the two bombs into mid-air, but luckily they were equipped with parachutes. Unluckily, only one bomb chute would open properly, leaving the other bomb hurtling towards Earth. The bomb would eventually arm itself on impact, but fortunately, the impact also damaged a separate necessary element for detonation. Had the bomb gone off, estimates say thermal radiation could have spread as far as 15 miles, possibly killing around 30,000 people. Suffice to say, America and the world narrowly escaped a horrific history-altering disaster that day. The Watergate scandal of the early 1970s is probably one of the most widely covered incidents in American history. The break-in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters in Washington, D.C., and the resulting cover-up that ensued engulfed the American media and ultimately led to the resignation of President Richard Nixon. However, it's quite possible none of this would have taken place had it not been for a misplaced piece of tape. <laughs> It turns out that during the ill-fated break-in, one of the burglars, ex-CIA agent James McCord, used tape to keep certain doors from locking, had they needed to make a quick exit. During the operation, Watergate Complex security guard Frank Wills noticed one of these pieces of tape on a door during one of his routine patrols of the building. You see, McCord put the tape over the lock horizontal instead of vertical, so a small piece was visible from either side of the door. Initially, Wills thought nothing of the tape and simply removed it. When Wills saw another piece of tape a little while later, he quickly became alarmed and called the cops. Before you know it, the break-in was foiled and soon the story was front page news. So if McCord did a better job with the tape, would any of this have ever come out? We'll never know. While we're speaking of Richard Nixon, another of his agendas nearly had a massive impact on history as well. This one was his desire to get famed musician John Lennon deported out of the United States. As Lennon's anti-war and leftist sympathies gained the attention of the FBI, it's believed Nixon saw Lennon as a threat to his 1972 re-election bid. With a 1968 drug conviction in England hanging over their heads, Lennon and wife Yoko Ono fought several years of immigration battles in the courts. Finally, in 1975, a judge's panel agreed to throw the 1968 drug conviction out as evidence against their deportation case. Allowed to stay in America permanently, Lennon and Ono moved to their Central Park residence, the Dakota, the same place where Lennon would be shot to death just a few years later. The sad irony here is if Lennon had been deported, he probably wouldn't have ever come in contact with his eventual killer, Mark David Chapman. What other music or world-changing impact would the duo have had had they been sent away from America in the mid-70s? Again, we'll never know. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Destination Anywhere. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and subscribe to the Mickey Shuffle on YouTube.